Okay, good morning everyone. Good morning and welcome to our Regional Workforce Challenges panel discussion. I'm James Walkinshaw. I represent the Braddock District on the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors and serve on the Vaco Board of Directors. I want to thank you all for coming today. We have three incredible panelists uh, from the House of Delegates with us today. Uh, let me just open it up and set the context and the stage a little bit for our discussion today. Virginia, as we know, is a recognized leader in business and economic development, but a key limiting factor in that economic development is a shortage of workers with training, the skills, or the credentials to fill positions that are open in our Commonwealth. According to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, in 2023, Virginia had 47 available workers for every 100 open jobs. 47 workers for every 100 jobs that are open. In August of 2024, this year, Virginia had 276,000 job openings. And a key challenge in addressing that gap is matching workers with the education or the training needed to fill those open jobs. In Fairfax County alone, uh, that I represent, there are 15,000 technology-related job openings. And many of them don't require four-year degrees, but do require specialized IT training and credentials. And we're working hard in a lot of ways, we're gonna talk about that today, to match training and education with jobs and communities, your communities across this commonwealth are grappling with the challenge and addressing it in, in unique ways. And we're fortunate today to have three great panelists who are going to give us their insights on this topic. I'll introduce them briefly. Delegate Terry Kilgore has been a member of the Virginia House of Delegates representing the 45th Legislative District since 1994. He represents Scott Lee in Wise Counties, the city of Norton, and part of Dickinson County. He's a member of the House Committees on Courts of Justice, <coughs> Commerce, and Energy and Rules. He's also the second highest ranking member in the Virginia House of Delegates, and he tells me that he is the smarter and better looking Kilgore brother. <laughs> That's him. <laughs> That's not what Gary said. <laughs> Uh, Delegate Bill Wiley represents the 32nd District in the House of Delegates, which includes parts of Frederick County and the City of Winchester. He served on the Winchester City Council and the Winchester Planning Commission, so he's a real glutton for local government and punishment. He was elected to the House of Delegates in 2020. He's been a leader on workforce issues and knows the challenges his region faces through his work as a member of the House Transportation, General Laws and Appropriations Committees. Happy to have him here to speak about the workforce challenges in his district and across the Commonwealth. And finally, Delegate Chad Green represents the 69th district in the Virginia House of Delegates, which includes part of York, York County, James City County, and Gloucester County, as well as part of the city of Newport News. Delegate Green served two terms on the York County Board of Supervisors. He's been a member of the House of Delegates since January of 2024 and we're delighted to have him here to speak about workforce challenges in his region and across the Commonwealth. I was doing some research for this panel and I was looking at his website and I saw a picture of him with his arm around a very short guy. He looked very short in the picture. The guy was Governor Glenn Youngkin. <laughs> Delegate Green is one of the few folks in Richmond taller than the governor. Um, and uh, he, we're very happy to, to have him here with us today. And I want to give each of our panelists a few minutes to give us some opening remarks, and then we'll jump into the questions. Doug and Kilgore, why don't we start with you? Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Walker, And uh, it's so great to be with you all uh, uh, this, this morning. It is still morning, yes. And uh, great to be here with uh, my panelists, uh, Delegate Wiley and Delegate Green. They're two of the rising stars in the General Assembly. They're really involved in uh, a lot that's going on as it relates to workforce, economic development, and uh, things of that nature. That's uh, what they focus on. A lot of times you'll see a lot of the arguments that are going on on the floor of the House, but I can say that these two gentlemen really want like to uh, represent their area and really work uh, hard on economic development jobs and making sure that that environment's uh, there for uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia. But uh, 
you know, just briefly uh, on workforce, uh, you know, a lot of us are, are out here and we're wanting to create jobs or trying to uh, make sure that uh, we have uh, new businesses uh, coming into our region. And, you know, we, we, we're looking at all of this in a, uh, you know, just we have to look at it all globally on what we do to make this happen. So, you know, I always have the issue uh, and, you know, tell my boards and our local economic developers, if uh, General Motors says, hey, we're going to create 5,000 jobs tomorrow, then the question I'm asking them is, where are we going to house these individuals so that they're not driving in to our community? So we really have to, uh, along with workforce, along with credentials, we have to address housing and, and those uh, opportunities uh, uh, all together. But uh, workforce, uh, you know, a lot of our community colleges, and we have, uh, I am fortunate to represent UVA Wise, they really step up when we have new businesses or old businesses that are there and need uh, programs set up, they are always uh, Johnny on the spot to help us uh, set those uh, programs up. Uh, you know, we've got some, uh, rural Virginia has some real great opportunities uh, coming up <coughs> in the not so distant future. There's a huge need for data centers. Somebody tells me up in Prince William and Loudon, they don't want them anymore, so we do. So uh, any of you know anyone with data centers uh, out there, uh, send them uh, to Southwest or Southside or some of our more rural areas. But data centers are also going to bring some workforce issues uh, along with it because you got to have folks that are willing to move to your area that are trained, and then you're going to have to train some of the folks in your communities to work uh, in those uh, data centers. <coughs> and finally, uh, health care. Healthcare is, uh, we all have shortages in healthcare across the Commonwealth, uh, no matter where you live, rural, urban, suburban, we all have those issues and trying to get those, uh, trying to get those uh, healthcare workers trained and to a job is uh, also uh, going to continue uh, to be a ch uh, challenge. But, uh, you know, we, we've turned the page, you know, when I, when I first started in this job, we were telling everybody they had to go to college. Everybody has to go to college, get that degree. That's not the case anymore in the workforce. We, it, we need folks with skills. We need folks with, uh, that know how to fix things. We need folks that know how to build uh, uh, buildings, build housing, and things of that nature. And, and it's incumbent upon you all and us as leaders uh, to talk to those parents who have kids in the sixth, seventh, eighth grade that hey, here's other opportunities where you can make just as much money and uh, meet the needs that we have in our area. So I'll turn it over to Doug Wilder. Thank you, Roger Cool Board. I certainly appreciate the uh, kudos. Uh, thanks, everybody, for letting me be here. Um, it's an honor to be service as a delegate in the 47th District in Manchester, Frederick County. Um, so I'd like to give a shout out to all the veterans here, um, to my fellow folks that served. Thank you for serving. And, uh, please, please remember the ones who paid the ultimate sacrifice. Um, so, in our situation, to a lot of his points, we share the same issues. Um, certainly, we share the same road system that I one, which is our artery uh, for uh, logistics um, business. Um, it's a big challenge we've been working on. I call it the 800 pound gorilla, considering how expensive it is to do projects on 81. We continue to try to find ways to be more efficient and try to find funding uh, mechanisms to continue developing that highway system to accommodate the demand. Um, so that's a big issue that plays into workforce development. Um, without that type of transportation network, we won't have industry that we want to be locating in our area for, for the winter clock. Um, so in my neck of the woods, we have you know, the fastest growing part of the state of Virginia right now. So um, basically, in the past, um, we've had a lot of properties get entitled, and post-COVID, it has basically been on steroids in that regard. Um, so we are fighting this dynamic right now to try how, to, how we can mitigate the development um, and, and impacts. Um, certainly speaking to data centers, we, we'd like to have an eye for the world, and the power is a big issue now, um, and so we're trying to push for that. Uh, it's really an easy fix for a way to really get the revenue streams going quickly. Um, but certainly with industry, we we're trying to do the same. And we have to find a way to partner with the um, education system and to try to get these people uh, ably uh, 
employed with those skills so that they can do the job that these industries are requiring. Um, and certainly working with our local um, you know, planning commission in the city and in the county, it's imperative that you as uh, in, in the county, so this is Vago, that you guys voice and talk to your uh, state legislators. We don't know otherwise. Uh, we need to communicate with you. Um, we need to find a way, a path forward to fix or to, uh, to handle this, these issues. Um, so I encourage you to have open conversation uh, with your uh, state, state folks. I think it's very important. Um, the only thing I want to say is, is, is uh, you know, with what we have going on in Winchester and Frederick County, the workforce, um, I think that we need, we need to find ways uh, creatively to work with our economic development folks uh, from the state, EDP, BEDA, um, and getting the same page of music in terms of what we're looking for, what these industries are looking for, and we have to be ahead of that. So whether it's infrastructure, it's going to be one, power, gas, water and sewer, we need to plan. So it's your imperative that you plan accordingly. So for your comprehensive plan, your strategic plan, whatever that is, it's imperative that you, you look forward. I always tell people, as elected officials, you're not here to make easy decisions. You're here to make decisions that um, are for the betterment of your community down the road. And some people won't like you. You signed up for this. So that's part of it. But the great thing about it is it's the reward 20, 30 years from now, and you will see a benefit when you think you've done something good for your area. So thank you for letting me be here. Again, thank you, and I might add that I am the tallest member of the General Assembly. Uh, I, I believe the governor is the tallest governor we've had at the time. Uh, there's a, a constant, uh, every time I see him, he's got a little bit taller cowboy boot on. <laughs> so, uh, I, I call that to him. But uh, anyway, I appreciate it. My name's Chad Green. This has been my first term uh, with the House of Delegates prior to that. I served eight years on the York County Board of Supervisors, and I see my replacement, uh, Wayne Drury, uh, sitting in the third row, not in the front row, but I uh, appreciate you being here. Uh, Delegate Kilgore hit the issues of housing and health care. Delegate Wildey hit the issues of transportation and planning. We hit the, the issue of education. We need to make sure that our schools are doing the proper job in having this educated workforce that we're a company would want to re relocate to Virginia and uh, would have the workforce and say, gosh, you know, these kids are ready to go to work. We don't have to do any type of remedial math training or remedial uh, English training. Uh, as a New York County Board of Supervisors, when we were there, we had a program that was, uh, we had a lot of internships and uh, we had uh, jobs with people in the community that say, hey, I'll, I'd like to have some high school uh, interns and uh, some of the local body shops, some of the electricians and HVAC uh, entered that program and it was very successful. So I think the schools play a big part in this. Uh, I serve on the education committee in the house and uh, it's one of their uh, big priorities is the, uh, not necessarily uh, workforce development, the, shop class, the other classes that when Terry was in school, uh, that people took. Now it's just gone. So, <laughs> yeah, anyway, with, with that, I'll uh, I move back. All right, th thank you all. Great, great comments. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with a couple of questions for panelists, and, and we'll open it up to you all as well, so be thinking of any questions that you want to ask. Uh, I'll, I'll direct the first question to Delegate Kilgore, but any of you feel free to, to jump in, but Delegate Kilgore has worked on this issue for a long time. In 2023, Governor Youngkin signed le legislation creating the Virginia Department of Workforce Development and Advancement, which for the first time brought the Commonwealth's workforce development programs under one new department. Uh, Delegate Kilgore, tell us how this consolidation of programs will improve the efficiency and the delivery of workforce development. Thank you. That, that's a great question. You know, we're, we've been working on this issue since actually the year 2000, uh, trying to get all our work, trying to get our arms around workforce development. We were spending uh, over, you know, between $750 million to a billion dollars a year on different programs of workforce development across 
uh, whether it's uh, the education uh, area, labor, here and there. So we were spending all this money uh, across uh, all these secretariats. And uh, I remember talking to Brian Slater, Secretary S uh, Slater, and he came uh, down to Southwest and said, hey, we really need to uh, make sure, try to figure out how to get all this under one roof. And I laughed. I said, good luck with that. We've tried that uh, since uh, 2000. And uh, Delegate Byron, Kathy Byron, some of you remember her, she worked on it. Uh, like She was constantly working on it. But Brian got everybody in the room, got everybody together. And this is really going to help streamline uh, our workforce development. A lot of other states out there were really beating us uh, <coughs> bad when it came to workforce development, what they could offer new businesses. They, would, they had the opportunity to, to just uh, uh, take a whole, you know, take everything over to that particular industry or that particular company just set up on their side and help them with their workforce development and, and help them uh, train those individuals uh, specifically for their business. So that's where we are. I think that's where we uh, can now be more nimble and now address our uh, industry's concerns, our industry's problems. You know, uh, technology is changing every day, and our industry is changing every day. And we, as a Commonwealth, have to be uh, able to change with the times and make sure that we can uh, help our industry. I'll see Bill and Chad have comments there. <coughs> All right. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, next question. This will be for everybody. A key challenge, and I mentioned this introduction in workforce development it is aligning training and education programs with industry needs, uh, which can change rapidly, do change rapidly. Uh, what challenges have you experienced in your respective regions in this regard? And have you seen successful models that maybe could be replicated elsewhere? And I will share one thing that we're working on in Fairfax County, which is a work-based learning program. And if you think about um, a low-wage worker who doesn't yet have the credential or the skill that an employer, maybe in the technology industry or somewhere else, um, needs to fill a job, that worker is in a challenging spot. If they're, they're living paycheck to paycheck, maybe juggling their family responsibilities, and they don't have the time or money or bandwidth to take that course or get that credential or even get that degree, whereas the employer needs somebody with that credential or skill or degree and they can't absorb the cost of hiring someone who doesn't yet have it. And a lot of small businesses aren't able to invest in their workers' education and training in the way that maybe a larger business could. Uh, so we have a pilot program in Fairfax County where we are providing a relatively modest subsidy to employers who are in that category. We will establish a work-based learning program to hire those lower skilled workers set up an education and training program to get them the skills that they need so they can ultimately fill the job that that employer um, needs to have filled. The program is, is in its infancy, but, but we're excited about the, the potential and promise of it to solve a problem for those workers and for the employers. But let me turn it over to our panelists and maybe we'll start on, on the other side uh, with, with Delegate Green. Sure, I mentioned this in, the, in my opening. Uh, York, we have done an intern program. So schools work with local business and business leaders, and they, it's been very successful. So I think it's a, a model that other counties could use. Uh, and some of the uh, <coughs> kids coming out of this uh, program will get jobs with their uh, intern provider. I know uh, there's a deeper frame and there's several young men I know in the community have gotten jobs with uh, Leaper being welders, and uh, some of them have even gotten jobs uh, in the auto body industry. So it's, it's been a good program. Uh, we're real fortunate that in our area uh, we have a very big employer, Huntington Angles, uh, we produce shipyard, and they are constantly looking for innovative ways to get people into their programs. And one program, one of the problems they're having right now is uh, kids not being able to pass security uh, checks. And when I say security checks, I mean that they have uh, problems with criminal records. 
they have problems with drug use, and some are not U.S. citizens. And so last I spoke with the uh, higher the human resources uh, coordinator at Huntington Angles, and those were the big issues. So uh, let's not forget those. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, um, I think in all parts of the municipalities throughout the state, we all kind of have a different way of maybe handling uh, the ever-changing workforce demand. Um, so, in, you know, I think we all share that if, you know, if we're working towards these CTE programs with the K-12 uh, system, I think that's it's coming along, uh, certainly the service um, the workforce needs from that end. Um, we certainly have that in place now in our neighborhoods, and it's, it's really reaping benefits. Uh, we appreciate the community college for doing the same. I think they there's an incentive program there. Pretty much your education is paid for if you go through the process. Um, but, you know, I think we even have Shannon University, which is a private university, but they're pivoting now from liberal arts programs to programs that are in demand, uh, engineering and the like. Um, the, the AI system and all these new type of breakthroughs. So they're, they're, they're adapting to the workforce demands um, as they come to the way. Um, we do have a unique program in our neighborhood, which is called Opportunity Scholars. Uh, it's being operated in the Militia and Valley. We're trying to expand the cloud now and to other neighboring counties. Basically, what it is, it's kids in the K, you know, basically high school system, and they go through um, a program, whatever interest school they have, it could be nursing, for example, or teaching, um, and they go through an education process. And if there's a cost of the education, uh, they basically sign up. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a contract, uh, for lack of better words. And they go through the educational process, and then the educational monies that are, you know, they're paid for, we're not talking $250,000 in debt after four years of college, this is something that's manageable. And then in return, when they, they have to live local and they have to be employed local. So they stay in the local economy, which is where you like to the future of the citizens and not leave. So in return, those monies that they go back, uh, basically they're taking out of their salary on um, the time they pay. And it's only like a three or four year uh, term. So it's manageable. Um, those are the type of things that we're looking for to be creative in terms of how to get these kids educated, get the skills they need, and get them employed so they can go out and be successful. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're going we got a great program at uh, Mount Montclair Community College. It's the, the Lineman program. And we really uh, have been training Ryan <coughs> and we really saw uh, what the effect of that when we had the big storms down in the southwest. You know, a lot of, I was without power six days, a lot of other people were out longer than that. But, you know, we saw all these linemen, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, trucks <coughs> and parking lots, and a lot of those, uh, the young kids have been through this lineman program at Mountain Empire Community College. And each one of those, uh, each one of those uh, kids come out of there and just and make great money right from the start just going through that uh, program. So those are the kind of the innovative ways that we, uh, our educators, our community colleges, our four-year colleges, you know, they find a niche where, you know, they find an industry and there's a big need in this one particular area, then you fill that niche. And that's why, that's where we have, we haven't been doing that, but I think we've uh, learned, uh, learned some lessons and now we're starting to uh, talk more with uh, industry and uh, figure out their needs and their wants. And that's what it's going to take uh, for uh, each of us. And that, that's what you all should do as supervisors. Not that I'm telling you what to do, but you should talk to your industry talk to your employers and see what their needs, see what their needs are, and then see how to address that need. That's that, first of all, that helps you, you know, get a, a rapport going with that individual. And second of all, it keeps that person in your locality. And they're not looking to move somewhere else where somebody else uh, can address that need. So that's just some advice. Okay, thank you. Well, why don't we open it up to questions or ideas from the audience? Yes, sir. Yes. Um, my name is Jesse Rutherford, Nelson County Board of Supervisors. First and foremost, thank you all for being here. It's always a pleasure to see you guys and uh, get the chance to interact. Um, this is kind of a two-fold piece. In my regular world where I have to pay how I pay my bills, I'm in new construction, specifically manufactured modular housing as well as affordable site-built housing. Um, and just the topic of workforce, and I think this is under-talked about, especially in central, south side, and even southeast side. We've had a large migration in the last 10 years of uh, Amish folk from Pennsylvania, Ohio, Delaware. 
And I'll, I'll look, be one of the first to say, if it wasn't for them moving to many parts of Virginia, we would not have much of a construction industry in those areas. That's material fact. Because if we were to try to keep up with workforce development in our high schools, I don't even think the output of student potential could even equate to what we have there. Um, I know we don't talk about it much, but however we can support those communities in getting their career in technical development in as well is critical because they're some of the highest performers in the construction industry. Segue from that, being from Nelson County, one of the largest workforces that we have is obviously hospitality, but after hospitality, it's work from home. What are, one thing that I think that's going to be critical for us in our school settings is how do we prepare our children for that next generation of administrative-based jobs where you're working from home. I can tell you this, when COVID hit, it was believed that our work from home population hit 45% because we do have wall-to-wall -wall fiber internet connection. Um, but I had friends who graduated from Nelson County High School, who went to VCU, who came back home, was looking for jobs, and they were getting you know six-figure jobs work from home in London and in the Euro world. And I think that is an under-talked about topic in workforce development, <coughs> is preparing that next generation for uh, work from home aspects. And again, I come from brick and mortar, so I understand the new construction. We need welders, we need framers, we need HVAC guys, electricians and plumbers. Want to advocate for them. Uh, but I'll tell you this, the demands that we see in the construction industry are so surreal that I don't even know if our population itself has the potential to satisfy all those demands. You bring up a very interesting dynamic, a challenge one like that. Um, so I'm in commercial construction, I completely agree with you on that. Um, we are very concerned about our labor force moving forward, because uh, certainly the housing need is, is real. Um, we are very short in supply. Um, and it's really a result of the Great Recession and then the COVID, and now we're so far behind. And then the affordable housing demand is having to deal with that. So we need all flavors of housing to get that. Um, so the challenge, you know, for us, you know, the, yeah, the work from home dynamic, I'm not so sure it's going to stay that way. Um, I think from a collaboration standpoint, you know, working together <coughs> in person is a dynamic. Maybe we need to kind of come back to that. We always pay for federal work. We're back to work in Virginia so they can pay for Walmart. That's another source of it. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the, the system, the, the current work from home model is a very interesting um, challenge for everybody. Um, it's, it's, it's also it's what's driving our area. Uh, it's cheaper living. You can get all the natural amenities with all the nine different woods. I want to live in Northern Virginia in an apartment. So I probably not live over there. I could live over in Manchester, Ferry County, to have the price of taxes and the cost of living. I can go get on the river or I can go shoot somewhere. And hey, man, this is pretty cool. Um, but I must say that, you know, yeah, we are dealing with those dynamics, and that's, that's the challenge we have with workforce because it changes all the time. How do we keep up? How do we stay ahead? Um, but I completely agree with you on making sure that you know, the folks that are in our neck of the woods, we got to get them trained up. And we've got to figure out a way to uh, to stay ahead of that demand um, so that when an opportunity comes up, we can accommodate you know, that industry a little bit more. I'm going to answer your question. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm David Eaton from Russell County, down in the southwest, Perry's home town area. Uh, one of the things that we identified and we've been working on is uh, to help break the cycle is going back to early uh, education, elementary education. Talking to them and uh, encouraging them to get on another path. Uh, so that's, we feel like that we've been pretty fortunate to be able to do that. I'd like to see the state of Virginia uh, put some kind of informational packet or book together and be able to put it in the hands of every elementary student in, in the whole Commonwealth of Virginia to encourage them to look for a path of entrepreneurship or workforce development to become a carpenter or a plumber or something like that and explain to them the benefit of these actions. We, we've looked at doing that in our locality. Also, we started a program I did about seven years ago called the RACE program where we paid for the first two years of education for every student in our county that goes to Southwest Virginia Community College. It's not for it. All we're doing is taking the tax dollars that they pay in uh, and then putting it back in the child. We wanted to keep them here for two additional years and uh, 
you know, I've got three sons, and I know from that that the maturity level of a child when they first graduate high school, they need a couple of years. Uh, you know, you send them away to college, and, and we're counting on them, some, some do well, some don't. But uh, we wanted to keep them in our tax base and in our, so hopefully that we could create more opportunities, more jobs. Get the need through the college system, like Terry said, to enhance the ability for that student to go right into that job. You know, whether it be a lineman or uh, in construction or anything like that. So, but I really think that we're going to have to go back. I don't know what it is. I, I was in business for myself for 30 years. We've lost a whole workforce group somewhere. I don't know where they went, but we've lost them. And I, I think to help break that cycle, we're going to have to implement an instruction type guide uh, in our, uh, if not, we're going to follow the same path. You know, going forward, I mean, you know, Papa did or Dad did it. I'm going to do it. So I'm not, I'm not going to uh, be challenged to get off that road and go into a different highway. So I think it's crucial that we go back to early educational uh, parameters and put some sort of emphasis in that to help break that cycle. Yeah, I like that idea, sir. Really, my son is, is yeah. four. He wants to be a police officer, a firefighter, an astronaut, a race car driver. <laughs> Politician isn't on his list. Oh, smart, smart. 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 Good advice. Good advice. Good advice. <laughs> I think you know one of the things that um, I think is key that, and, and those of us in local government with our state partners are maybe uniquely positioned to do, is really find those partnerships in our community. So. One of the things that we've done in Fairfax is we partnered with the Metropolitan Washington Airports Authority that runs Dallas Airport. And one of the fascinating things that happens at Dallas Airport and other airports, every year, hundreds of cars are abandoned um, in the parking lots there for, for different reasons. Sometimes people get on a flight and they don't return. They pass away at their destination or maybe there's a criminal activity involved and they dump the car purposefully, so we established a partnership between the airport and our auto tech program in our school. So the auto tech program gets those cars, they fix them up, work on them, sell them, and that funding helps to support the auto tech program. And those kids who are in the auto tech program get apprenticeships with the airport's authority. Because one of the fastest growing industries is actually um, air, aircraft tech, right? So, and if you have the skills to work on cars, you have the beginnings of the skills to work on airplanes and all the other machinery <coughs> that's at the airport. And that, that came about really just from, you know, people piecing things together and relationships and partnerships. And I think that's one thing that we can really do at the local level is to brainstorm what are those entities in our community or in our region where we could establish those kind of win-win partnerships. Uh, any of our panelists want to jump into yeah. the points that were made? Yeah, uh, I think uh, one, one point to uh, David's comment is uh, we have to get to those meetings where the parents are, where the, the PTA meetings, the parent night, parent <coughs> night at the school, and things like that. I think it's incumbent upon us as uh, us in the political system. We need to get to those uh, meetings and talk about uh, you know opportunities in other areas other than just uh, a four-year degree, and a lot of kids, you know, they're, they're going to want that four-year degree. They have other uh, aspirations, but uh, you know, if you get to the parents and and, and talk to them, and, and they see what uh, uh, certain trades pay, I think you know, I think it's a, a way to get uh, uh, folks uh, uh, moving towards some of the trades and some of our uh, uh, workforce development. Yes, sir. Hi. I'm uh, John Ward from New Kent County, uh, and in, in speaking of that, um, one of the things I've heard before is the biggest deterrent for somebody going into a trade is two parents with college educations, um, that, as you talk about that path. But my question is, when you bring a, a large employer in, do you have discussions with them about housing? Um, because what we're seeing right now, we have a number of big employers that are coming in, and we don't have the housing. We're counting on the counties around us to have housing, but we don't right now. But is there any type of cooperation that has occurred with large employers that come in and putting aside something? 
for, for their new employees? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so you guys are familiar with how this works in terms of industries looking in your area, right? It's Project XYZ. Project XYZ is coming from the DDP typically, the state agency. And they're looking for a location that can then satisfy their demographic requirements. So it's everything from infrastructure to manpower to you know, incentives, where it may be, and then hopefully you give them more of the opportunity. But your question about housing, <coughs> we don't see that uh, in terms of that question. Uh, the EP is usually handles those reins, and then we need to figure out a way to accommodate that industry that's coming in the area. So that's a great question, and I would encourage you to work with the Economic Development Authority on that. Uh, one thing that is, and I pointed out to them recently, is in my neck of the woods, we had a project called Project Wonka. And I'll leave it up to you, what you think it might be. Um, I'm surprised they named it that. But anyway, um, they, they were a very demanding group. Um, but the reality of what they, they wanted at the end of the uh, conversation, they found a piece of dirt and were ready to go, and they said, we want our building built in six months. And I looked at them like, you're crazy. And I'm like, the Economic Development Authority should be educating these people in terms of the realities of what the process is, right? A schedule, you know, general information, and they have it. And we have to be, you know, pretty proactive and forthcoming about it, whether it's good or bad news. We need to get that information out quickly so that we can get them to delineate whether they want to move there or not. Um, so those are some of the conversations that I encourage you to talk to your Economic Development Authority partners as well as the folks in Richmond, um, because if they don't know, they don't know. And just talk about some of the issues you're having and maybe find a way that um, it, can, it can work for the better moving forward for opportunities so that you're not caught in a situation where you're happy, you don't have housing and you got to catch up. So, thank you. John, John, just to follow up on that, uh, Churchill Downs, the racetrack up in New Kent, is fabulous. I would encourage anybody here and want to go for a good day of racing to uh, go to New Kent. It is first class. They've done a, a very nice job. March 15th, Virginia Derby. Which the Virginia Derby will, will be a qualifier for the Kentucky Derby. Correct. So uh, it's, a, it's a great facility and uh, it's really going to be an economic driver uh, there in New Kent. One of the things that we don't want to do, and I remember during the session, you know, these calls, hey, we understand that the General Assembly is going to take away all the uh, zoning authority from local boards of supervisors. No, we don't want to do that. We don't want to get into it. We don't ever want to take that away. At least this group right here uh, does. Uh, so that's one of the things that uh, where your board of supervisors really need to be proactive and say, hey, there's a track of land here that would make sense to develop. There's a track of land that would not make sense to develop and kind of have these uh, pre-planning um, issues there already done. Uh, a lot of the issues that I saw when I was on the board was when we would have what people would consider rampant development. And usually if you can keep development to at or below 2%, that's just sort of the, the natural way. But when it kind of all of a sudden somebody sees a couple new neighborhoods coming, that's when your phone starts ringing supervisor so you really need to, to get back and, and kind of do some pre-planning on this and, and, and figure out what you what you want your county to look like uh, ahead of somebody coming in and saying hey this is what we want your county to look like so uh, keep, keep that in mind and that's going to be a, that's going to be a continued issue with uh, a limited amount of undeveloped land in all of our counties and cities uh, and what goes there I think, you know, with respect to the housing conversation with the business community, and it's a dialogue we have in Fairfax County with businesses that want to locate or expand in, in the county, especially technology <coughs> businesses or international corporations, and, and typically what they want to do is bring more of their highly paid executives to their headquarters in Fairfax County. And so the housing question for them usually isn't is there an apartment or a condo that our employee employees will be able to rent right they, these are folks who want to live in a single family home and one of the challenges that remote work has created is that the demand for single family homes is intense because you know in my family my wife's job is fully remote there are some days where 
I can have meetings with my constituents from my basement in the office. So two of our four bedrooms are now offices. And that's an expectation that people increasingly have. And we aren't going to build, I see Supervisor Herity here from, from our board, we're not going to build a lot of new single family homes in Fairfax County. There just isn't a place to do it. But one of the things that we can do is expand options for seniors and older adults. And there is intense demand in Northern Virginia, I suspect elsewhere, for active living communities, retirement communities, for people who want to age in place and they want to stay in Fairfax County or in their home community, they're close to their grandkids, close to their social network. And when we can provide those opportunities, they're then moving out of that single family home that maybe the executive from Volkswagen can move into. So that's not a full solution, but, but one thing that I think can help long term is if we provide those other kinds of housing opportunities. I saw you had your hand up for a while. Go ahead.
companies from Korea, from Germany, from Belgium, etc., are coming in and say, and, and they find it really pretty weak uh, what we offer. They, you know, they appreciate our understanding for their needs and their, our, you know, collective efforts. But they ask, you know, so if I do that, what's it for me? And the answer is not a lot. So I would like if you can comment. Most of the apprentice programs that I am familiar with in New York, James City, Newport News, have been very successful. In fact, the employers have hired many of the apprentices, uh, whether it be Huntington Angles, whether it be uh, Reaper America, uh, whether it be just uh, some local automotive places. So it's, it's been a very successful program. Uh, about 12 years ago, I was on the school superintendent's advisory board, and uh, one day we had the president of our local health system come in, and he was very concerned about the nursing students that they were seeing. They have their own program, nursing program through uh, Riverside Health Systems. They were very concerned about the math skills uh, that these uh, would-be nurses uh, were, having, were having to take remedial math classes. So that's an example where an employer came to a school division and some changes were made. Yes, ma'am. So I'm not sure if that answered your question. That's sort of what's going on in the last year in my, in my whole section of the comment. So is that, is that the, uh, <coughs> the employers have the program but it's kind of difficult to fill the positions of apprentices? Or is it that we need to think about additional incentives for employers to develop? Because developing an apprenticeship program that is worth its you know, development condition uh, needs some, some investment. So employers don't do that as a side job. They have to really invest in that. And sometimes they say, well, yeah, I know.
talked a few of my uh, waterman buddies into making crab pots, and I had about 150 crab pots, which I applied the uh, lower part of the Chesapeake Channel or River over uh, a great uh, business venture, and I did it all the way uh, through uh, the college. Uh, and uh, at the end of college, I said, hey, this is not a way that you're going to be able to support a family, so uh, I ended up selling out to a uh, larger seafood uh, I've always kept my involvement in the uh, seafood industry. Uh, right now, I have a partnership with some aquaculture folks uh, in the oyster uh, business. Uh, we've got an oyster farm, which is uh, kind of an interesting thing. Uh, the seafood business, the people who pick crabs and pack crabs uh, are oftentimes very low-skill uh, type folks. Uh, there are oftentimes people that you're uh, getting on some temporary uh, visas and things, and uh, if you are skilled at uh, picking crabs and shucking oysters, uh, the way the incentives are, you can make some decent money for someone with skill levels like that. Uh, what you're kind of seeing is uh, in the seafood industry, you're seeing the more in aquaculture, VIMS, uh, and I'm not sure if any of y'all know what VIMS is, it's now the Patton School uh, for Marine Science, but it's a offshoot of William and Mary. It's located at Wasser Point, which is in my district. And they're really doing some creative ideas into aquaculture and trying to have sustainable harvests uh, with, with the fisheries. So uh, if you look around at who is going into uh, the seafood industry these days, uh, it's not your local kids. Uh, it's mainly big corporations. Uh, it's not a really a sustainable way with the catches and anytime you're dealing with a wild uh, cock harvest with biomass, uh, there's big ups and downs and uh, it's, a, it's a tough business. So I wouldn't recommend it if anybody wants, if anybody wants to lose some money, go ahead and buy a crab. All right, let's go back to the audience. Yes. Hello, um, I'm a commissioner in Greenberg County, West Virginia. Um, but a question that I have
why that, you know, working with local boards of supervisors and others, there are other treatment opportunities now. So that's, that's what we're working on. Yeah, if I may add, um, you know, a lot of these issues with the drug situation is manifested through mental health, um, and certainly through the uh, governor and, and uh, the GE members. We've been working hard to try to put a lot of money into that. Um, I think we still have a challenge with the state um, facilities to get them staffed. Uh, with the beds is not much of a concern, it's just getting the staff to handle the capacity. Um, and that flows all the way downstream to the localities. So it's, um, it's coming just like any government this time. Um, but that being said, I think we've made some good headway and some efforts in trying to address that. But I think a lot of it's manifested through the mental health. So we got to kind of go after that the big snakehead there and get that off and, and address it. Um, and we see a lot of that post COVID and what's going on there. So um, to that point, I think that's something we really need to continue um, you know, working on. And helping our I just worked on funding for our local hospital. So if you need help, there's a room you can go get help. And um, we're just not going to worry you know, and we've got a team that can address your mental health issues and get you a place for future help. So um, those are some of the things we're trying to do. And I think it's going to get better. Thank you. I'll hit on this a little bit at the beginning, but it's been a huge issue uh, with some other employers in my area that require top secret and, and secret clearances to do works on aircraft carriers and submarines and some of the Navy ships. And prior drug use and current drug use, uh, even though at the state level, some of it might be legal, are still uh, not accepted. So. <clears throat> I think it, some of it goes back to our role in connecting the dots and connecting people. So I mentioned earlier our work-based learning efforts in Fairfax and the cohort of employees who will be part of that are identified in part by our Department of Family Services. So some of them are folks who have had substance abuse challenges or mental health challenges or been involved with the criminal justice system in some way, shape, or form, and that program gives them the opportunity um, to broaden their skills and feed and help local businesses. Let's go back to, so going back there, yes sir? Yes sir. My name is uh, Chuck Presley, I'm from uh, Towson County. One thing we did do with the OPO and the Payment uh, Authority, we're working with Russell County to, uh, to have uh, some of the, the guys in the program be transferred to have their own ha a house stay in. That helps with the regional jail bill, too. So it's weird not being rich Delhi. But for the, for the delegates, I got a question. Because, uh, you know, at the school level, I think, you know, we're just not teaching the kids what they need to know, uh, let's say, finance, economics. They just don't understand it. So when you were talking about Lynchburg, I, I coached soccer at Grand High School and football. I've been in soccer 19 years. I've been doing football for nine. And I had one young man that didn't have a dad. He killed himself, but he went down the same ball. And he's going to flight school because he came to me. He said, I don't want to do all this stuff, but I want to go to flight school. I said, well, to get to flight school, you have to do this. And it changed his mindset. So he went to school, but now he's doing it. He started climbing. So I just want to ask y'all, what are you doing at the state level to change the uh, – how we teach kids in high school. Because a lot of that stuff they don't even use, they don't even care about. And when I talk to people up in Chesterfield and stuff like that, they have, I guess, appointed schools they go to, they can go towards engineering and things like that. So in Southwest Virginia, I think we do a poor job of that and we do a poor job at vocational. I, I see a lot of my kids go to vocational. A lot of them go to line in school. They're like, I said, like, don't have this debt. They don't understand it. I, got, I went to Virginia Tech, I have two degrees. I don't use it for anything. I was a poor kid that grew up in Bluefield, man, some an immigrant, and now I've got 47 rental houses, so if I can do it, anybody can do it. So how has the state changed the mindset of uh, the young man stuff? I mean, that's a great question, and, uh, uh, you know, a lot of schools are teaching finance and, and you know, how to, you know, just how to write a check, uh, how to sit down for an interview. Uh, my wife actually taught that before she retired, how to actually, uh, uh, you know, she would bring uh, Eastman Chemical Company over and do interviews, mock interviews for students. You know, they don't even, a lot of times they don't even know how to do a resume. And things oh, I have no clue. Uh, but we do have to teach more practical skills. Uh, you know, I, I had the same comment with my uh, uh, algebra teacher, and, and I remember talking to her one day, and she was like, 
why do you not concentrate more on this algebra? I said, I'm going and at that time, I decided I'm going to be a lawyer. I said, all i got to figure out is how to divide by three in my job. Like that. And she's like, oh, yeah, you'll need this, you'll need this algebra uh, from now on. But we, we do need to be teaching uh, kids practical skills. And there's a lot of skills out there that, uh, you know, whether it's balancing the checkbook, whether it's uh, figuring out what a, a bank loan, uh, how a bank Well, they don't know how equity works. Yeah, how it works and things of that nature. We, we do need to do a better job. And, and I think, uh, you know, there's been a lot of uh, bills go through, legislation attempt to go through uh, our education committees on, uh, you know, teaching more practical. And sometimes they just get tied up uh, in that uh, arena up there because of interest groups that uh, fight against that, some of that stuff. But, you know, I, I, you've got a great point. Well, I was, yeah, I got two more things too. I was yeah. going to ask you guys about when it comes to building homes. We're dealing with these carbon offsets now. How do you guys deal? Because I know the forest land through managed uh, timber. They're sitting on uh, timber and they're not cutting, so those prices will start skyrocketing eventually. So how do we offset that? Do you guys know anything about that? You need to talk to the other side. Gotcha. Not the Republican Party. Gotcha. Um, I can just. I'm not being political here, but. The reality of it is, is that the clean energy requirements are nuts. We are going to bankrupt our state. If we get, uh, if they get their way in terms of where they want to go with it. Um, the solar issue, I think we've talked a little bit about that. We want to you know, basically take the controls away from the locality, which we completely disagree. Um, in terms of the requirements for the building, um, we're trying to address affordable housing yet, but you want to put more restrictions yeah. and the numbers don't work. Um, so, yes, certainly we want to clean as well, but it's got to be financially feasible. Yeah, what's the state doing about social media? Because, as you guys know, when a real problem for kids now, their internet doesn't work. When Terry's growing up, he might get drafted. You know, because he was making fun of you because you were older than everybody. Else. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just kidding. But, like, how do we do that? Because a lot of the boys are just weak minded now. I mean, that's, I mean, people don't want to talk about it, but it's true. They, it's all about making money. They don't care about community. It's, it's strange to see the dynamic change in the past 10 years of coaching. That mindset is not hurting, that it's hurting America. It really is. Serving on the education committee this year, I noticed a lot of bills that went through that were great in theory, but they uh, caused more uh, burden, more paperwork for the teachers Whereas, you know, I, I don't know if I would want to be a teacher in this situation uh, right now because it, not only are they, they're expected to be social workers, they're expected to report this. Report. Just like police officers. And, you know, it, it seems like it, a lot of the responsibilities that parents, that my parents have had, that I have for my kids, uh, the, the parents now are just uh, kind of shying away from that. A lot of the, right, the laws and bills that were passed, uh, I thought, did nothing to educate our kids, but made it harder on teachers and coaches to do their job, which is to teach and educate our kids. So. You know, I tell all my boys, you can be one thing, just don't be a sissy. So, you know what I'm saying? So, they get that eventually. So, that's all I wanted to ask. I, I think, um, to, to, to your point and the story you shared about the young man that you one of the things that we look at is something we call free to succeed. And when we look at kids in our communities, if they have three positive factors in their lives, even if they have other challenges or come from homes with a lot of other challenges, if they have at least three positive things going on, they're very likely to succeed. And we have a list of those positive things. But I would say the most important thing on that list is do they have an adult that they trust to talk to. And it sounds like that young man, you gave well, him some I, great advice. Well, I have another young man, he was he wanted to kill himself about 10 years ago. He said because I would give him a hug every once in a while. Yeah. He didn't kill himself, yeah. so. Sometimes they just need a hug and just right. tell them it's okay. What's more important than the specific advice you gave it's him true. or what you specifically taught him was the fact that you cared about him and you didn't have to. No. Um, so that's why I'm that's a coach. That's something we can Enjoy. try to spread throughout, throughout our communities. Anybody else in the audience? Yeah, Phil. Yeah, Phil Moore, Proto County Board of Supervisors. I want to share a couple things. One, uh, we
we have memorandum. By the way, growing up county, you go six miles in the direction, you're in another jurisdiction. Which is kind of nice for kind of a tight region there. The city of Salem and the county of Bonneton has memorandums of understanding uh, between both school districts, or all three districts. So and we have a chart that we've shared with uh, some legislators to show that 10 trades that are going to be offered at our new TCTE school uh, are not offered at Salem and Bonneton schools. And um, so with that said, these memorandums of understanding which will allow their students if we have capacity to come over to our CTE school, which is right by the airport, one of those beautiful pieces of property that was a hidden jewel, and in two years that's going to be open. Uh, we might want to put in an adult education program for people that work in the day to come at night to learn HVAC because of the need there, carpentry, if you will, uh, which we have in our current CTE program. But we don't have a fluid adult education program. Now, with that said, I think a couple years ago, I understood there was going to be some reorganization of workforce development, and it was going to be all pulled under one department. Am I imagining that? Or that happened. That was, uh, we, we talked about that. Yep. Okay, so with that said, uh, I know it just started to get reorganized, and it takes time. Do you have any idea what programs you decide to go to Virginia that are going to be available for maybe grants for you know, adults to enhance their skills? Yeah, I think uh, there, there are going to be uh, some opportunities there, and I think uh, uh, Secretary Slater and his team are working hard on that. But uh, that, that I, there should be a website out there that uh, uh, would direct you to that. But that's a, a great opportunity <coughs> there that you're providing for uh, the Roanoke, uh, Roanoke Valley area. I'm not even going to say Southwest Virginia because that's one of my uh, – uh, you know, I always get irritated. Somebody says, I'm in Southwest Virginia today, Terry. I'm in Roanoke. I say, Roanoke's halfway to Richmond for me. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 to get to Southwest, you've got to go through Roanoke. So I, we, I agree. I agree. We're, we, feel, we feel like we're part of you, too. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll take it. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Anyone else in the audience? Yes, Bob. Uh, Terry Kilgore and I have been side by side in Wise County since 1994. It's not all glamour and prestige. <laughs> no, you're exactly right. But there's a man that has run a successful law practice all these years. I see him at a meeting at 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning, and he's got three more places to be before his day ends. Lebanon, here, there. It's uh, it has to be a love and commitment for his people in the region. Maybe the law practice is making more money <laughs> than we know about. Hey, Bob, they, at my law practice, they say I'm a part-time. That's what they always say. Hey, Terry just does his part-time. But no, anybody, uh, Bob, that's a good point. Anybody that does this public service, you're, you're just doing it for uh, your, your, the love of your constituents. I mean, what you get paid for uh, doing this isn't even close to the hours that you have to spend uh, night and day. If something really going on, then it really uh, steps up. So, and you supervisors, uh, you know, I hand it to you. That's a job. But the school board and the supervisors are, you know, you're right there with the public every day. They're calling you day and night. You know, if somebody's uh, trash isn't picked up or or something, you know, you're the person they go to. So I appreciate, I know uh, these uh, delegates, uh, we all appreciate the uh, frontline efforts that you do, and we're just here to work with you all and try to make life a little bit easier for our joint constituents. That's what it's all about. 
All right, we're, we're almost at, at time, um, and in addition to his service to the community and his part-time law practice, Delegate Kilgore is also very generous in spending time with us here at Baco. We appreciate you for that and appreciate both Delegate Wiley and Green for doing the same. And I just want to pose one final question uh, that each of you can address if you like. Uh, two of you have served in local government. Uh, Delegate Kilgore is honorary. Make it honorary. <laughs> Uh, what are the keys to the state and local partnership in addressing the workforce challenges that we discussed here today? How can we work better together and, and what can we as local government officials do to better partner with you on this workforce issue? Don't look to us for the good ideas. We are looking to you for the good ideas to bring those to us because as Delegate Kilgore stated, you are the front line folks. You are the folks who are going to say, hey, wait a minute, this program that you implemented is good, but it needs these adjustments. That's what we need to hear. We need to hear those things. Uh, so don't look to us for the good ideas. We're looking to you for the good ideas to bring them to us, and we'll come across the finish line. Yeah, it's a great point. I mean, in addition to that, um, what's goes on in Richmond, certainly we're inundated with lobbying groups and, and different folks from different uh, areas of the state. So what you might need might be something else maybe in, in the city of call it Virginia Beach that they don't need. So sometimes that shoe doesn't fit off. Um, so we have to be creative on how to make that policy work uh, that benefits the Commonwealth and whole and the municipalities related. Um, so we have that dynamic that push pull in terms of sometimes it works better in the city rather than the county. Um, so when we do policy it is not um, done in a vacuum, and it's certainly not done haphazardly. Uh, when policy is voted on, it's ready. It's teed up, eyes are dotted, T's are crossed. It's been vetted. Uh, so when you bring something to us, you got to really make sure that thing's ready to roll. Otherwise, it will die in subcommittee, and then you guys will be frustrated. We'll be frustrated. So I just want to encourage you, um, and we'll work, we'll work with you in terms of what we see on the other side, in terms of what uh, things that need to be vetted accordingly. Uh, you want to get that policy ready to roll. Thank you. Yeah, I, think, I think the key is communication. Stay in, stay in contact with your uh, local uh, delegate, local senator. Uh, uh, I encourage all of you all to get in touch with uh, whoever represents you and, and let them know your concerns. And, uh, and that's the way it works. And, and a lot of times uh, we're up there and there's 3,000 bills filed. And, you know, maybe it's not my committee. Maybe it's in somebody else's committee. But I can tell you one thing, if one of my supervisors or somebody from Southwest Virginia calls, we can get back to them really, really quick because we know that something's up, something's up. So I encourage y'all to call. They're going to, your legislators uh, in your area, when they see your name and your supervisor, they're going to call you back. They're going to try to find out what is going on that you would call them or that you come and see them. I have a rule in my office, if somebody's from Southwest Virginia, there's a bunch of lobbyists sitting out there. Those folks from Southwest Virginia jump ahead. They get ahead in that game uh, into my office. So uh, communication is the key. Uh, we do not have the uh, we don't have the best uh, solutions all the time. You all are on the front lines. Tell us what's working. If, it, if it's crazy, just tell us it's crazy. That's what you got to do. Thank you. All right. And if it's crazy, I'll tell you it's crazy. <laughs> thank thank, thank you all for joining us. If we didn't get to your question, or if you think yeah. of a question, you can share it with James, and uh, we'll get you an answer.